So we'll have a discussion on problem number six from the 2017 BC exam. And as problem number six has been on a pretty consistent basis, this question deals with series. And it's a non-calculator question, and, and we'll get right into it. So they provided us with this bit of information off the top here. So f of 0 is 0, f prime of 0 is 1. And then they give us this really weird sort of relationship here between the next derivative and the prior derivative. So the next derivative that you're looking for, the n plus first derivative evaluated at 0, is going to be equivalent to the prior order derivative that you were looking for. So if, if this is a third derivative here, evaluated at zero, uh, we'd have that equivalent to negative two, right? The prior derivative, the prior order of the, the order of the prior derivative, if I could speak in English, uh, times the value of the prior derivative at zero. So kind of a weird relationship. It holds four n's that are greater than or equal to one. Now if we check out what we're asked to do, function f has derivatives all orders between these x's. The derivatives satisfy the conditions that we just talked about. The Maclaurin series for f converges to f of x for the range of x values between negative one and one, right? Absolute value of x is less than one. Part A asks us to show that the first four non-zero terms of the Maclaurin series, so a Maclaurin series is just a series, that a Taylor series that's based at zero, uh, for f are these, and then write the general term of the Maclaurin series for f. So I went ahead and, and listed out the definition of the Maclaurin series expansion for a function f. So we're always going to have a sum from zero to infinity. We're going to have the nth derivative evaluated at where the series is based, divided by n factorial times x minus zero, or just plain old x, raised to the nth power. And I went ahead and I wrote out this definition in expanded form. So I listed out my n equals 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 terms because what I was asked to do is I was asked to write out the first four non-zero terms. Now I actually wrote the first five terms of this particular series because I kind of looked at what we were trying to build and, and they were nice enough to provide us with what, what we're trying to develop and I noticed we had an x to the fourth there and, and the only way I can get an x to the fourth from this definition is if I go ahead and, and apply the index until I get to a value of four. So I went ahead and, and kind of used that to list a fifth term and, and sure enough when you start producing these terms specific to the information that you were provided with right here the, the first term is going to have a value of zero. Uh, the zero if derivative evaluated at zero or the function divided ex evaluated at zero divided by zero factorial times x to the 0 power is going to give us 0. Uh, the first derivative evaluated at 0 is 1. So I put 1 here divided by 1 factorial times x to the first. Well, well that's going to simplify to this. The next derivative is when I start needing to use this weird relationship that we talked about a minute or two ago. I need the second derivative evaluated at 0 to go into this numerator right here. So f double prime of zero would require me to be working with an n value of one, right? In order to get an order of my derivative to be two, n would have to be one. So the second derivative evaluated at zero would require for me to use an n value of one. So if I put one here, I'd get negative one times the prior order derivative evaluated at zero. Well, the prior order derivative is the first derivative evaluated at zero, which is one, as taken straight from this line right here. So I have negative one times f prime of one in the position where you see f prime of zero divided by two factorial x to the second. And I've done the same thing with the third derivative evaluated at zero. So I put a two here. And then the, the second derivative evaluated at zero, which is this numerator, uh, is what you see in this set of grouping symbols. And then I went ahead and produced the factorial, three factorial is six. And then I also did that for my, my term that's listed here in expanded form. So the n value of three going here is going to produce me, perform me the value of my fourth derivative at zero. So that'll be negative three times the third derivative evaluated at zero. Well, the third derivative evaluated at zero is what you see in this numerator right here, and negative two times negative one is two. So it's kind of weird being required to use this, but once you see how it works, it's not too bad. And if you simplify these terms, what you're gonna see is, is you're gonna see that 
uh, they do give you the terms that they specified up here. Now, if you scroll down a little bit here, what I have done is, is I realized not only do I want those first four non-zero terms, I want to also write the general term, right? And so I went ahead and, and I get to decide how I want to index this series that we've just written down. And I thought it made sense, a lot of sense, to, to begin with an index of one. So I changed the index from originally I was using n, I just changed it to a k. Uh, and I'm saying, hey, this is my k equals one term, k equals two term. And I did that because I obviously saw a two there and a two there. So it was convenient to just have k equals two for that term, k equals three for this term, which implied that my series was going to therefore start with an index value of one being utilized. And I noticed that the terms with the odd index had to be positive and the terms with the even index had to be the negative ones. So I inserted this alternating term in my general rule and I made sure when I had an odd k that I added one to it to make it even and generate these positive terms. And then the even k's, when you add one to them, they become negative, giving you the negative terms where you need them. And then the rest of that rule is pretty straightforward. For any term that we look at individually, the power is k, the denominator is k, so there's your general term. In part B, what we're asked to do is to determine whether that series from part A converges absolutely, converges conditionally, or diverges at the x value of 1. And then, as always, it asks us to try to explain that thought process. So I, I wrote in sigma notation the series that we listed in part A here, right? So there's the general term that you might recognize from that previous screen. Uh, but if you think about putting 1 in place of the x, what do you end up with? Well, when you put 1 in place of this x, what you end up with is, is just negative 1 to the k plus 1 over k with the, as the rule for the series. And you might notice that as the alternating harmonic series. And I'm sure what you said about the alternating harmonic series is that it converges. So when x is equal to 1, when we put this number in place of x, the only thing left in the numerator is the alternating term, since 1 to any power is always going to be 1. Uh, and that alternating harmonic series converges. So we can basically, by recognizing that it converges when x is equal to 1, we can rule this out right now. Uh, it's not going to diverge. Now, is it conditionally convergent or is it absolutely convergent? So if you take away the alternating condition, if you take the absolute value of the rule for the series, what you end up with is a numerator that's now fixed at positive 1. Not alternating between positive 1 and negative 1, but fixed at positive 1. Now, if we think about this series, this is the harmonic series. The harmonic series diverges. So what conclusion can you develop? Well, since that alternating condition is required to be present in order to allow the series to converge, this series can be classified as conditionally convergent at x equals 1. And that is part b. In part c, we're asked to write the first four non-zero terms and the general term of the Maclaurin series for this new function, g of x. So you will notice that the variable in g is the upper limit of integration, and it's, it's got uh, inside the integral as the integrand the function f of t that we already have a series representation for. So from a, we know that this is the series representation for f of x. For f of t, I just need to swap out the, the x's for t's. So that's what you see I've done within the integral right here. I've swapped out the x's in the series for f of x with t's. And now I'm thinking, hey, if, if I'm trying to evaluate this definite integral, find a nice series representation for g of x, I'm going to use the fundamental theorem of calculus. I'm going to find the antiderivative of this integrand. So power rule applied to each of the terms that you see listed here will generate these for you. And then if you apply the power rule to this term right here, the, the negative we're taking the integral with respect to t. So the, the k in, in, that you see in this exponent and in this denominator, those are unaffected as as you do the integral with respect to t. Now t to the k, since we do have the variable t within that base, and we are doing an integral with respect to t, we are going to have to use a power rule on it. But this piece, you'll see I just copied it into my general term. I copied the over k into my general term. I added 1 to that power. I divided by the new power. Here's an antiderivative for what we have as the original integrand. Now if I toss in the limits of integration and take a difference, if I put x in place of all the t's, I end up with this. If I put 0 in place of all the t's, I end up with 0. So I end up with this minus 0. What are the first four non-zero terms? Well, these four that you see listed here. And then the general term is listed in that set of grouping symbols as well. 
And if you go on to part D, what they ask you to do is they ask you to build off of part C a little bit. So I just copied the, the series from part C into the screen that we're going to discuss part D on. And if we check out what we're asked to do within part D, it says P sub N of 1 half is the nth degree Taylor polynomial for G based at 0 evaluated at x equals 1 half. G is the function described in part C. We've already said that. Use the alternating series error bound to show that the difference between the fourth degree Taylor polynomials value at 1 half and the actual function value for G at 1 half is less than 1 over 500. So the error between this fourth degree Taylor polynomial approximation and the exact function value on G at 1 half show that that error is less than 1 over 500. They're actually really, really nice with the way that they phrased this because they've, they've told you that you're supposed to use an alternating series error bound. They haven't put you in a decision where you've got to decide between the alternating series error bound and the Lagrange error bound. Uh, whenever you can, the alternating series error bound is way easier to establish, uh, and, and they've actually asked us to use that here. And so what is our fourth degree Taylor polynomial? So if I just write out these terms so that I end up with a polynomial of degree four. Here's my fourth degree polynomial. Well, what's my fourth degree polynomial evaluated at one half? Well, I would just put one half in place of all the x's, and you see that in a kind of ugly looking form listed right here. This would be the estimate for g of one half, whatever this turns out to be numerically. How can we bound the error? Well, the alternating series error bound is always to use the first term that's been omitted. Well, what's the first term that's been omitted from the series right here when we evaluate it at 1 half? Well, the first term that's been omitted is 1 half to the fifth power divided by 20. And so our alternating series error bound is going to end up being smaller than 1 half to the fifth power divided by 20. If you simplify that a little bit, that's 1 32nd divided by 20. Change that to multiplication by the reciprocal. You're looking at 1 over 32 times 20. 20 times 30 is 600. 20 times 2 is 40. So that denominator ends up being 640. 1 over 640 is less than 1 over 500. So yeah, the, the exact error between our fourth degree Taylor polynomial approximation and the exact function value at 1 half is going to be smaller than 1 over 500.